Good morning or good evening afternoon for most of the attendees here. Um, my name is Jennifer Robison. I'm super excited to be here at CloudGen uh, talking to you about testing and React Native. So welcome to testing, testing one, two, three, React Native testing tools. Uh, so again, my name is Jennifer Robison. Uh, coincidentally, I go by Code Jen uh, on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at CMEJet on GitHub or Jennifer Robison on LinkedIn. So before we get started, a little bit about myself. I started my career actually as an administrative professional at the age of 18, but I knew that when I was uh, doing this, it was really just a stepping stone to bigger things. I was able to gain a lot of efficiencies in my role and show my manager I was willing and able to take on additional work. I began working on our department websites way back when it was just simple WYSIWYG editors and working with basic HTML. I have followed a non-traditional path of being self-taught and then getting my degree after, after the fact. But that was of course before coding boot camps were really a thing, which I think is really amazing. But that's enough about me. So why are we really here? React Native has been growing increasingly popular. There is an allure that you can have one code base that allows you to rapidly get a mobile application for both iOS and Android, and now even the web, Windows, and Mac OS. It was a no-brainer for many JavaScript developers. Although it's still not a full 1.0 release, many production, applica production applications have been deployed in the App Store and this means you should have some code confidence. Code confidence comes with testing. So we're gonna talk about different types of testing, what are your options for end-to-end, -end, and the high-level integration with continuous integration services. So what are the types of testing we're working with? This was a great image about testing with JavaScript that I found from Can't See Dots. You start with your base, building your foundation with static tests. These are typically things your IDE will help catch for you, like typos and type errors, as you write your code. Next, you move to the unit tests. These are isolated and verify that individual functions are doing what you expect. This can be something as simple as a function that takes in an address object and returns a string with a formatted value. Moving up, you're getting into integration tests, which are ensuring that several units are working together in harmony. Finally, the most difficult part is automated testing, especially on mobile, the tip of the testing pyramid, the crown jewel end-to-end -end tests. These are like an autonomous user clicking around your application to verify it's functioning as expected. So what's the hardest test to write? The first one, no joke. No matter what level of test you're writing, just getting in the groove and writing the first test is the most difficult part of getting started. Once you write one, they start to flow more naturally on a given project. So a good testing cycle is to write a failing test. Make it pass, then refactor. This is considered the red, green, yellow cycle. Obviously ending on green when you're done refactoring. This is true test-driven development. It takes a lot of practice. This cycle is more easily applied to unit tests, but can also be applied to end-to-end -to -end tests in a behavior-driven testing environment known as BDD. So as we start to talk about what tools are available, we'll start here with unit testing. Jest is one of the most popular testing libraries out there, and the one we'll be focusing on today for these types of tests. At its core, it is maintained by Facebook and was made to provide a zero config setup for maximum performance. These tests cover small pieces of code, such as functions or classes, things like data conversions or utilities that help with rendering or logic. For instance, I may retrieve a value from a database for status that is rejected, but I want to display it as declined instead. This gives me one common place to make these changes. I use my testing cycle to write tests, failing tests, write the minimal amount of code to make it pass, refactor it as needed, 
and add additional code coverage for different test cases. I believe that unit tests are well defined across JavaScript frameworks, and although we could spend a lot of time talking about those, what I'm really here to talk to you about is end-to-end -end tests within React Native. From my experience, this has been one of the most challenging areas for, de for developers to truly embrace in this ecosystem. Here you can see there are a few options that we can use. So let's dive into a little bit more about these specifically. So again, here we have Jest. As I already mentioned, it was created by Facebook and most commonly used for unit testing. It offers a pretty simple integration with React Native when it comes to end-to-end -end integration, since it's already included with the default initialization for unit testing. However, in my opinion and experience, it's like an incomplete puzzle. It's missing some key pieces. When integrated with React Native testing library, it can test your components, but it's not intended to test the implementation details and user interactions. These are called snapshot tests and capture a moment in time. Snapshot tests have several weak points. When a snapshot is created, at that point in time, it's considered to be correct even in the case when the rendered output might actually be wrong. When a snapshot test fails, it's tempting to update it using the parameter update snapshot without taking proper care to investigate whether the change is expected. Certain developer discipline is really needed here. So is it really a good option for end-to-end -end testing? From my experience using Jest with Enzyme to try and get closer to the ideal state of end-to-end, -end, it still had too many hurdles to overcome. Shallow renders and difficulty in finding elements on the page left a really bad taste in my mouth. On the other hand, Jest is a great option, as I mentioned, for unit testing. So here's a sample code utilizing Jest to do validation <coughs> for snapshot testing. You can see at the bottom, it is relying on a snapshot of your view in order to validate that what you returned after pressing the button is what you got back. It's not actually clear in the code base what the snapshot should actually be. If you were new to this code base, would you be able to understand what this is testing and that the expected return values are at a glance? So when the test fails, you'll likely be tempted to just update the snapshot to help the test pass, but it may not be the actual expected behavior any longer. So now we'll look at Appium. Appium is a general test framework intended to work with several platforms. Think of it like Selenium, but for mobile. Because of this, the documentation for specific mobile architectures is lacking. Appium works on the native layer and can be set up for your language of choice. It can tend to be a tad bit flaky. Appium's element finding algorithms operate on the UI accessibility layer, meaning if certain elements are marked as important for accessibility, it determines others are unimportant and that makes Appium unable to find them. So here's an example of what tests written with Appium configured for JavaScript might look like. You can see it's using a web driver and that it's expecting to find elements by accessibility identifiers down there at the bottom. So now here we are with native tests. This requires knowledge in native languages such as Swift or Objective-C for iOS and Kotlin or Java for Android. One of the appeals of React Native is that you don't have to be a native developer in order to release a cross-platform application. In addition, you'd be writing a native test for iOS and then again for Android to have the proper code confidence for both platforms. I'm not a native developer. I took this example from a Git repository of a React Native project. I don't know about you, but to me, it's not super clear what is happening in these tests, but I'm also, again, not a native developer. So here's just the rest of that test. So now Detox. Detox was developed especially to target cross-platform mobile application development. 
It currently supports both iOS and Android, and you can write a single set of tests in either JavaScript or TypeScript if you prefer. It has the ability to monitor asynchronous activity, allows you to debug and test your application with varying levels of permissions and more. If you can't tell, I'm a little bit biased to this testing framework. I won't lie, it's been far from perfect and has its own set of problems, but it has been by far the best option thus far for React Native. Finally, last but not least, this super cute little logo over here is Cavi. Cavi is a framework I recently learned about. It claims to have you testing within five minutes. It also has cross-platform uh, support and boasts first-class TypeScript and claims to have an easy integration with continuous integration. Unlike Detox, Cavi is purely JavaScript based and therefore does not, not tie into the native dependencies. This also means it has some limitations. It cannot interact with any native elements that you cannot assign a reference to, such as permission dialogues, file pickers, and the camera. So now that we've covered the different types of testing, as well as some of the options for end-to-end -end testing, specifically for React Native, let's dive a bit deeper and actually get into some coding. The main focus will be uh, detox. However, I will touch a little on Cavi at the end, as I really do some great do see some great potential there. It is just lacking in that native integration, as I mentioned. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'm going to be switching over to a terminal and doing some live coding, so please forgive me for anything that might happen. We're going to use NPX. Um, I don't utilize the React Native CLI by default, so we're going to call NPX React Native. We're going to tell it we want to init a project. We are going to call this Code Gen App, and I am going to use a template that we have created at my company, EchoBind. It is an open source template. So this is our command, npx react native init my application name, and then I'm going to give it the template. This is a TypeScript template, and it will take a moment to actually run this command, download the template. Um, the React Native CLI is going to then install the dependencies and get it going. So forgive me for the brief, I think it takes about a minute and a half for it to actually initialize this. You can see it's now downloading the template, processing it, and installing the dependencies directly for me. from previous. So installing dependencies is what takes the longest amount of time in this process. So it's doing the yarn installation um, of all of those dependencies, and now it's doing the CocoaPod dependencies for iOS specifically. And as soon as this part is done, we'll actually dive into the code as it does a build. switch into my project here. We will open up code while I get a build going. So we're going to run the build so we can see what this application looks like. But let's first dig into the code here a little bit. Start with the package. You'll see we have several scripts here for you. Um, some really great convenient scripts, some that are using Hygen templates. Um, we have some good iOS, um, you know, already set with a simulator uh, tag, so you can update that to whatever simulator you would like. We have the 
Android ones. Um, we have an Android clean, and then we have some convenience scripts that we'll really be getting into for detox. But you'll see we have uh, React Native. We're utilizing um, some of the other dev dependencies already in here for you. Detox, we have Jest, Hygen. So this is a really great template to get started utilizing uh, React Native with TypeScript and having all of the testing frameworks already enabled for you. So let's let it finish building the application. <clears throat> Which again takes a moment. While it's finishing, we'll go ahead and run the unit tests that come with this template. We just have a simple um, trim text function in here as an example, so that as you're building your application, you have something to rely on. So uh, we've called yarn test. You can see we now have our trim text test file running. So we had two test pass, one test suite. We'll go ahead and go back over to the code and take a quick peek at what um, that test structure looks like. As I said, most people are familiar with unit testing, uh, especially with Jest in JavaScript, so uh, I won't dive too much into that. But here we have our describe block for trim text. We have our first test, which is it should trim a long string to the allotted length, and then it should trim a long string to the default length. So we have different parameters we're passing in, and both of those tests pass, which is awesome. I think our build might be complete now. Yep, our build is complete. So let's take a peek at our application. So this is our code gem app that we just built. You can see we have our intro screen here with a login button. If I click on the login button, it takes me to a login form, which has an email input, a password input, a forgot password link, which just brings up an alert because it hasn't been implemented in this template. And then the login button, which would be if you had entered the email and password, it would then navigate you back here to the intro screen. So now that we've seen kind of what the actual, um, the, the application is looking like, We'll look at our first test, which we include for detox already set up for you. So I could be running detox commands by themselves, which I would first have to say yarn detox build. I would have to tell it what configuration I want to um, run. So this I will flip back over to our package file because it is important to know how the detox configuration works. It's actually in the detox JSON file. So we have a couple configurations here. We have our sim debug, which is running on an iOS simulator um, with a configuration of debug. And then we have our release build, which would be run from a CI. Um, you can see here its configuration is released to match its name. And these names can be changed. These are just the defaults suggested. So Android EMU for emulator debug as well, and then the release and you can see these need to specify device names. So now that we know like what we're running here, I, like I said, I could run yarn detox build, passing it a configuration, which would run, and then I would have to say yarn test, pass a configuration of the same thing. But instead of doing all of that, I'm gonna use the convenience script that we've provided for you, which is end-to-end -end iOS debug. This combines the two, it does the build, and then the test, and it also passes the cleanup param. So while it's doing its build, let's go back to the package file and we'll take a peek at that um, convenience script really quick. So you can see it's running exactly what I was just talking about, but it also has a cleanup prop at the end. Um, and then I can just type one command instead of both. So this is going to run the Xcode build for iOS. Um, I am focusing on iOS today just for brevity and the amount of time that we have. However, all of these are set up to run on Android as well. As you can see, the convenience scripts were there for you. The configurations were there already in the de detox.json file. So it's a really simple setup. Once this detox build for testing runs once, the subsequent builds 
run much faster or test cycles run much faster because Xcode does cache the build for us. So we'll let this finish running. It will bring up our simulator. We'll start to see it flash the screen because it will be doing some reloading and um, and then it will test that intro screen. But it will take a moment for Xcode to do its build. Xcode builds are probably one of the lengthiest parts of the, the cycle. So I'm very thankful that they do cache those and the subsequent passes throughs are much faster. Getting there, we see assets being built. And our build has succeeded and it is starting to get into our test suite. So it's going to spin up the app. There's our code gen app. It flickers because it's doing a reload, which we'll show you in just a moment. So this is the test we have provided by default intro screen. So let's jump back over to our code and take a look at what is that test actually doing? So here you can see before each test, we're reloading React Native, which is why you saw the simulator flash and reload from the splash screen. And then it's running the test. It's expecting that there's an element with an ID of intro screen text to be visible. Next, it's expecting that there's an element with that same ID to have the text welcome to the intro screen, which if you remember, as we were looking at the application template when we spun it up the first time, it did have that text on the screen along with the login button. So we could have added an additional expect here on this test. So this is the test that we provide by default, and this just shows what can be done. It shows that everything is already set up for you. Let's go ahead and add a new test. So as I mentioned, we have HiGen, which is a template generator that helps us again with convenience. So I'm going to say yarn G for generate with a colon, and I'm going to tell it I want to do an end to end test. And you'll know you'll be able to look at what all of these are in the package script section. And so I just need to provide it a name for what I want my test to be. So I'm telling it to generate an end to end test for login screen. It went and added login screen dot spec to my end-to-end -end file or folder. So let's look at what that's doing. So here we got a shell of a test. We imported the identifiers that we need from detox for you. <clears throat> we, we left in the before each. And then we have a, a shell describe block here, which can be modified to do what you need. So before we actually write our first test, let's take a peek at our login screen. So here on our login screen, you can see we have a background image, we have a status bar element, we have a screen wrapper with a test ID of login screen, and then we have a login component. So let's start by just testing that our login screen is visible, similar to our first intro test, which was testing that that was available. So on load, it should show expected elements. Let's start with that. So we're going to look for element by ID login screen to exist. So I'm going to save this test and I'm going to go back here and I'm going to run our end to end iOS debug. Now you'll notice that when I run this command, as I mentioned previously with our cache built, it was much faster in that second cycle. So the intro screen spec is going to run first. Again, one thing I have found with detox is it's not really, um, there's no rhyme or reason to which test will run first in which order. So now it's gonna run my login screen spec that we just created. It's gonna reload the application. And you can already see that our login screen on load show expected elements failed. Well, why do you think that is? If we were looking at that emulator, if you were watching it as it was interacting, you'll notice it was still on the intro screen. So our, our test starts by 
uh, reloading to the initial state of the application. Well, the initial state of our application is always to be on the intro screen when it reloads. So that is obviously not our login screen. We need, before we can do any of our tests for our login screen, we need to make sure we're actually on our login screen. So let's add in a wait here. We're gonna look for an element by ID of login button. If we go back to our intro screen, you'll notice uh, we have here our test ID for intro screen. And down here we have our login button and this login button is what's going to navigate us to login. So this is what we want to make sure that we're tapping on as a user in order to get to our login screen and then be able to test our functionality. So it looked like it was login button like that and we're going to tap that before each of these additional tests. So now let's go test those again. Once again, our cache build helps us be much faster. This time our login screen test is going to run before intro. Our app is spinning up. You saw it tap on the login button. It was super fast. It's the fastest autonomous user you'll, you'll see. Um, it found the element of login screen to be there once it was actually able to navigate and that test passed. But let's add a little bit more, right? We have our other elements on the screen that we wanna make sure are there on load. So our login screen has this test ID of login screen. We already found that one. But then we have this component that we wanna take a peek into. It has several elements, as you can see when we are looking at the application, it has some input fields. So here we have an email input, a password input, forgot password link, and then we have a login button that we can tap. So let's make sure these key features are actually on our screen when the page loads. So we're going to await and expect element by ID um, email input to exist. So very similar to the login screen. Um, that we have already been looking at. We're using the identifier of uh, to exist. So then we're going to have our password input. And for this one, let's use a different um, expect statement. And we're going to say this one is going to be visible. So this is honestly testing the same thing, but I'm just showing here some different ways you can test elements on the page. And then finally, we'll add in our um, by ID, our login button, which unfortunately is not named by default in the same manner, which we would probably want to have that consistency. Um, we're going to also say that this one is visible and we are going to go run our tests again. So we're going through this cycle, making sure our tests pass. Our build has succeeded again. Great, because we haven't changed anything in the actual React Native code. Our login screen uh, specification is going to run first. And it looks like everything passed once again. Here now it'll move back to the intro screen, but while it's doing that, let's go ahead and add a more complex test. This one is going to be doing a little bit more user interaction. So the value in having this code confidence and knowing that our application is working as we expect it for our users is being able to interact with it like a user. So let's actually input an email and a password and click the login button and interact with our tests. So we're going to say allows user to log in. These are our function just as above. So we are going to um, uh, first, we're not doing expects on these because we've already checked that these exist on the page. So we're just going to, whoops, we're going to say element by ID. Um, we're going to start with that email input. And here I can interact with my 
um, element in a few different ways. I could tell it I want to replace the text, but I want to have a little bit more fun and I want to say I want to type the text. And I'm going to say Jen at mail.com, which is not really my email address. But uh, for brevity, I'm going to keep it that way. And then we're going to say element by ID password input. And I'm going to type text into this field as well. And it's going to be password one, two, three, four, my super secure password. And then finally, we want it to then tap the login button because I want to actually submit that form. So I'm going to do my login button and I'm going to tap it, which is my touch. And then if you remember from my brief overview of the application, in this case, if I tap the login button, it will take me back to the intro screen. Obviously, once you wired up that feature, it would navigate you somewhere else. But for this, we are going to say this is our expect. We're going to await and we're going to expect that the element by ID of intro screen is visible because that's where it should have taken me after I've done the login. Now you can see my weight has the red squigglies. This is an example of my static testing because it's letting me know I have something wrong in my IDE and I did not make this test an async function, so I couldn't use the await block or the await keyword. So now I've added my async, my test is happy. I'm going to go ahead and run my test again. Now this will go pretty fast when it spins up, so pay close attention, but you'll notice it'll tap on the login button from intro screen. It will tap into the email input. It will then quickly type. You won't be able to hear it, but I can actually hear the keyboard uh, entry on the simulator, which is kind of cool. And then it will tap on that button as we've told it to do and it will navigate back to the intro screen. Let it spin up again. So we get to our login. Let's see, oh, we had a test fail. What happened? We did not get back to our intro screen. So let's make sure we find out what happened here. Let the test finish running. So we had one that didn't pass, and that was our password input. Uh, and then it should have done the login button, and then it should have gotten back to our intro screen. So a couple things here. I like to put awaits in front of these to make sure that the interaction actually happened because they do take a moment. Um, and let's see if that fixes it alone. Let's also double check that um, on our login form, login.tsx, that the IDs are what I expected them. So we had our test ID, password input, and then we have our login button, which should do our login press and take us back to our screen. So let's go ahead and run this test cycle again. Let it spin up. So thankful that these cache builds run so much faster. Oh, there we go. So I just needed those awaits. So great lesson in uh, that asynchronous execution of your code. So that test is now passing. The two specifications on our login screen are now green. It's going to run the intro, which we haven't changed anything, and it will also continue to be green. So what about Cavi? We dug into uh, detox a little bit here. I'm going to pop back on over to my presentation and go a little bit further into some of um, our uh, information about Cavi. As I mentioned, this is an open source React Native template that I'm utilizing. It helps jump you 
um, to the front of the line with just detox some of those starter components like you saw the the login form um, there's a registration form in there it has routing enabled with react navigation so it really can help you get started with react native if you're unfamiliar um, so here's a link to some great documents Documentation for detox, which gives you a lot of the life cycle um, API information as well as matchers. Something to be aware of in addition to the await on an async call is a wait for. So some elements do take a little bit longer to appear, like if it's making an API call to an actual API. Um, so you just want to be able to plan for those. So remember how I touched on Cavi. I just recently um, had learned about this pretty awesome testing framework, as I mentioned earlier. It's actually been around for quite some time, but I had never heard of it. And I've been working on iterations of end-to-end -end testing with React Native for a few years now. I'm pretty impressed with how easy it was to set up and use, so I wanted to share a preview of what I learned. As I did mention, it has some limitations when it comes to the native features, but this may not apply to your app, so it's worth sharing. If you don't need to worry about accepting permissions for things like the camera, location, or notifications, or if you have your code set up where you could utilize environment flags to block the presentation of these dialogues to test other features, then this library could really be for you. And I think it's worth checking out. So to get started with Cavi, it's really as simple as using their CLI. In this case, I do suggest downloading their CLI. It was really helpful. So once you've got that global dependency added, you can add Cavi as a dev dependency to your project with yarn add Cavi dash dash dev. And then you add in the type definitions if you're use, utilizing TypeScript like our, our template has enabled, and then you do Cavi init into your project. That adds a few files for you and really just gets you started. So Cavi uses test hooks, which I think is pretty cool. Here's what they look like. And you need to just place them on the screen where you want to test. So you import the use Cavi from the Cavi library, then you create a const to generate a test hook, and then you just add it as a reference. So instead of using test IDs, um, Cavi is using the reference identifiers. So as you can see here, we generated a test hook for intro screen. Um, this is the same code that you were seeing for the intro screen in the template. And um, you just need to wire up your application into the, um, the index that Cavi relies on, and it will start to run your tests. So in this case, um, I really did get started within five minutes. Uh, I then just ran Cavi run iOS, and you can see it was using a workspace. And um, down at the bottom, the red arrow, you can see how quickly these tests ran. They were so fast. Of course, this was a pretty simple test, but when I compared it to the speed of detox build test command, as you guys were seeing, in um, even with the cached builds, the same exact test cycle, it was under one second in Cavi, and it took about eight seconds with detox. This is fantastic for apps where you don't need to worry about any of those native tie-ins. So check out cavi.app for more information on that. So now that we've set ourselves up with all of these tests to help give us that code confidence, we wanna make sure that they're helping us identify any problems before we deploy or even merge our code into a main branch. This is where our continuous integration setup will save our bacon. It can be a hook for pull requests, maybe pre-merge into a branch, or even a nightly build if it's helping validate API expectations haven't changed. So here we have just two CI options, although there are so many. Check out reactnativetesting.io for more info on setting up services such as Travis and GitHub Actions. To be transparent, we have spent a great deal of time in our day-to-day -day job working with Circle CI, but we're migrating over to GitHub Actions for the cost to our clients and the ease of setup. Code magic is also something that I have found to be pretty great. So the great news is no matter what CI option you go with, many of them support the usage of Fastlane, something we like to take advantage of in our team. 
We're even working on a CLI for React Native projects that will help you with the initial setup of projects and get you through the release. The important thing to note here is that the more you can put in Fastlane, the easier it becomes to port to whatever service you would like to use. So I'll quickly touch on some options to help you utilize Circle CI for your setup. One way to get started is documented within our React Native template repository and utilizes HiGen to facilitate your setup. We have a setup that allows you to encrypt your environment variables, key stores, Google service accounts, and more using cryptics. Our Fastlane configuration can then read and decrypt these values during the build process and help push to the app stores for you. This is the power of CI. So Bitrise has some great build tools. It's definitely aimed at mobile apps. Unfortunately, it became a major challenge with Detox in my last few attempts working with it. I had some working builds with Detox in the past, uh, you know, and part of my whole code confidence is in those CI builds and not just running them locally. Wix even has references to the configuration in their docs. However, I just found they timed out. Code Magic, as I mentioned, was another great CI service that is supposed to work really well with React Native and Detox, but admittedly, I have not yet had the opportunity to fully dive into that. With that, we'll focus on the setup uh, with Circle CI just for your information here. I attempted to use the configurations listed from the Detox repo to no avail on Bitrise. I kept hitting those timeouts. And then I experienced some similar issues with commands not being recognized on Circle CI either. I finally unpacked the React Native community orb for Circle and found the magic recipe. And so I really wanted to share what I've learned. This isn't included in our template since CI services and project setup can really vary from project to project or even organization depending upon what you're doing. But I wanted to share again what I learned to see um, what can help get this working. So to unpack that React Native Community Orb, you do need the Circle CI CLI to be able to process their configurations. You can remove then certain features in there, um, update configuration. So uh, in the React Native Community Orb, I found that they were using an older version of Mac OS, an older version of Xcode, you know, node dependencies weren't necessarily at the right level and which iPhone simulator I might want to use, um, along with some special configurations for Android. So I've taken a few screenshots here just to kind of show once I unpacked this configuration file of some of the things that I wanted to make sure um, to cover. So I updated the Mac OS um, Xcode uh, uh, configuration. I removed some of the commands in the homebrew install and in configuring the detox environment. So you can see I just commented out on the third line of homebrew down here. I did not find this to be necessary and node eight is quite outdated. Um, we do have to make sure that we're installing the Apple SIM utils. These are some of the things you need in order to run detox on your system. Um, and then also, you know, the Android SDK. Now in this one being the iOS build, this command I could have also removed because I don't need the Android SDK here. And we have separated out the iOS and Android build commands. So here is the rest of the file uh, for iOS test. And you can see at the very bottom here, we finally execute a detox test um, build with the configuration of the iOS sim release. We're using log level worn and running it headless. So before I did that, it did do the, um, the build of the iOS application. And you can see it's running um, a workspace with the destination and all of that is really important to have updated. So here is the Android configuration. One of the most important findings is that you can run the Android build on a Linux image, but it won't give you access to emulators that you need. So for this, you need to revert back to a Mac machine. In order to accomplish this, we cache the build after it completes um, on the Circle CI configuration. So you'll see again here, we're just doing some you know simple like dependency updates, you know having the Android APK available to us, setting some Java options. 
And then you'll see up at the top here, this is our Android test configuration, again, running on that same Xcode um, configuration. This could be updated again with some of the newest changes for Xcode and React Native. Um, the, we then have to make sure that we configure our, our environment here again. So we have our homebrew settings here. And in this case, we really do need to get the Android SDK running. And some really cool stuff happening here. We're getting the SDK set up. And then at the bottom, you'll see create Android emulator. Uh, this is where it's really important for the name of the device that you're creating to match the name of the device that you are expecting to run from your Android release configuration for detox. So in this case, we named it test AVD and we would want to make sure in our test, in our detox configuration of our project, we had that set up for our release build. So again, at the very bottom, after we've booted up an Android emulator in the background and we've waited for it to be ready, then we'll run the detox command for release, again with log level worn and headless. So this has a lot of changes that we needed to do to tweak the configurations along the way. Um, I wanted to share this with you because when new versions of iOS or Android or even React Native are released, sometimes you have to make these adjustments to get them working on CI again, and it could have nothing to do with your project specifically. Dig in, it's really worth it. So I wanted to thank you for um, you know, the time here at CodeGen 2021. And um, I would love to take any questions if you have them. One thing I will note as I give you guys a moment to ask any questions is that um, my colleague, Mike Cavalier, is also putting out an ebook cut into the Jamstack build and deploy a full stack application using React and Next.js. So this will get you building a live SaaS app from scratch. There'll be the full source code um, included and it'll be a really great opportunity to really dig into some of that Jamstack development, which fits really well with all the JavaScript, TypeScript stuff we're talking about. Uh, check out cutintothejamstack.com for more information there. Otherwise, uh, like I said, if you guys have any questions, I would love to hear from you. I really appreciated your time. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to me if you have any questions along the way. I'll give you guys a few minutes. Do you have any questions? Looks like the chat is pretty quiet, so I will go ahead and end this, but I really appreciate all of your time and I hope that you have uh, more code confidence with your React Native applications setting up end-to-end -end testing. Thank you.